Tony Owen is an honorary associate professor in nuclear physics at the Australian National University. Tony Owen, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Paul. So what do we learn from this report when it comes to building nuclear power? Well, I think you've got to look at the Genkos report and, and what it does. So the first thing is that um, for CSIRO, Oricon produce all the figures, the capital costs, the ops costs and everything for all the technologies except nuclear. So they don't do anything for nuclear. The last time CSIRO commissioned uh, an expert report on nuclear was 2018. And that's been disputed ever since. And even CSIRO say the basis is not clear. Mm. So that they're still not getting any expert advice on, on nuclear. The, the next thing is the, the way that they, they treat the technologies. So for instance, when they're doing the calculation, they say the lifetime of, of, of solar is 30 years and they use the same figure 30 years for nuclear. Mm. Now, nuclear obviously has got a 60 to 80 year lifetime. You, you've got to replace all the existing solar before 2050. So this isn't taken into account. The other thing that's not taken into account is the different levels of support they give to the grid, because solar obviously doesn't support the grid, but nuclear you know, gives the system strength, gives the frequency control, et cetera, all the things that the the current coal-fired power stations, you know, to sort of give to it. Um, the next thing is capacity factor because they produce uh, capital figures. So if you look at the, they the, say the current capital figures they produce for um, large-scale solar, one thousand five hundred twenty-six dollars a kilowatt. They say uh, large-scale nuclear, eight thousand six hundred fifty-five. Therefore, obviously, you know, nuclear is nearly three times the cost of, of solar. But it isn't because the capacity factor, of, you know, the actual electricity generation of nuclear is 95% and the, the solar average is about 26%. So when you multiply that up, you get the same sort of figures. So if you take into account lifetime adjustments for firming, adjustments for transmission, you actually find that solar is about twice the cost of nuclear. Mm. So the GenCost 2023-24 report, uh, GenCost CSIRO say they estimated large-scale nuclear costs using South Korea's nuclear program. They adjusted for differences in Australian and South Korean deployment costs. Was that not a useful methodology, you don't think? It, it was, except that instead of using a, a nuclear expertise to do it, they tried to do it on the basis of a coal-fired power station and, and do the costs. Where the, whereas they could have got an experienced nuclear consultancy to give them the actual cost. Yeah, right. But the, the figure is, is not um, not way out. They're saying 8,655 for a large-scale nuclear power plant, you know, in, mm. in 2023 current, current figures. So uh, that sort of figure is actually very competitive. If you, if you took into account all the, the systems cost and, and not just, you know, look at the the sort of first capital cost. So I, I'm curious then, why would CSIRO have done it this way, as opposed to, I suppose, taking into account all the factors that you're talking about that might actually make nuclear power stack up uh, better against renewable energy options? Well, government policy is renewables, isn't it? So they're obviously looking to support that. Yeah. So where to, uh, I, I suppose, in terms of the debate, uh, the opposition uh, obviously uh, have the idea that they want to release a nuclear policy. They haven't released the actual detail, nor have they named the sites. Um, do you think there's a path forward either through CSIRO, GenCost, or doing their own modelling that could show a viable path forward for nuclear power in Australia? Yeah, I, I think there's got to be proper modelling of the, the whole of system costs, which we don't do properly at the moment. You know, there's, as well as the all the countries that have got nuclear, there's about 50, you know, in, in advanced stages of nuclear programs, new countries as well. So there's a lot of countries, and particularly countries around us, you know, in, in our region, all moving towards nuclear. And, you, you know, even the GenCost report says that um, we can't get to 100% renewables. It says 90% is, is about the limit. So, 
you know, the other 10% at the moment, the mm. government is saying, well, that'll have to be sort of gas, you know, the new gas policy. But, you know, there's, there's certainly a place for, for nuclear in it. And the, the, the best yeah. way is, is to repower the retiring coal-fired power stations with, with nuclear. Okay, so uh, that's certainly the sketch, that's the outline of the policy from the opposition, the idea that they're saying coal-fired power station sites would be the best place to build them. How many do you think we'd need? If you were going to announce a large-scale uh, nuclear power plant program, how many plants would you build in Australia? Well, you'd have a, a, a progressive, uh, you know, building being with programmers, coal fired, were retired, you replace them. This is what Bill Gates is doing in the US and Wyoming, because you, you reuse all the infrastructure and particularly the transmission. So you don't need all this new transmission that's causing us a huge amount of problems uh, at, at the moment. You can use the existing infrastructure, cooling water, et cetera. But most importantly, you can retrain the staff because most of a nuclear power station is exactly the same as a coal fire station. Mm. You know, if you're a turbine operator, you're a turbine operator. Um, you know, and, and it really, you know, it saves jobs and saves these communities, which otherwise are, are going to die. Mm. Where's the uranium and do we have enough of it? Oh, I mean, we've got twice as much uranium as anywhere else in, in the world. I mean, at the moment, we export it all. And, you know, we save emissions uh, from electricity generation in, in all of these other countries. Do you have thoughts as well about where the waste goes? Because we haven't even got a low to medium uh, level waste facility, let alone a high level waste facility, which I imagine would be needed for uh, an operation like this to build large scale nuclear. So is that a, is that a fairly big hurdle for us to, sum, to uh, overcome if we did want to pursue this? No, because everybody else in the world has got a low level. I mean, that's just a near surface level facility. There's actually one in in Western Australia, you know. Tell us have got a facility that accepts low level waste. And that's so we the... have, we have got one. And so oh, I was referring to that. Yeah, the federal government is attempting to build a low to medium yes. uh, to intermediate yeah. level waste, and they haven't been yeah. able to do that yet. Um. So just to be clear about that, so you're saying a large scale nuclear power reactor, say they if it was built in the Hunter Valley, um, you could take the, the waste that comes from that is classed as low-level waste. So the day-to-day -day operations is only low-level waste. So a big nuclear power plant produces about two shipping containers of low-level waste a year. So this is clothing, um, cleaning materials, mm -hmm. the sort of routine day-to-day. -day. goes into a drum. You can stand alongside it. And still, have got thousands of them in a shed, mm. you know, waiting for a low-level repository. Right. And, so and everybody in the world's got what, one of those. Sure, that's that's the kind of stuff as you're talking about. It's sort of things that have been irradiated by being present in the in the facility. But what about the actual the actual material itself, actual nuclear material? That's high. Le that's high yes. level, right? So that's that's the only high-level waste that's produced. So it's when a, a reactor is refueled. Um, the, the spent fuel is put into a cooling pond at the reactor and stays there for about five years. And then you've got a number of options. So you can either send it for recycling, which is what we do at the moment. So the fuel from the Opal reactor, our research reactor at Lucas Heights, mm. goes to France, reprocess, re extract the uranium, and you can reuse that. You know, and then you get, just get a little bit of waste back, which is what you know we've we've got back as as intermediate level waste. Right. And then but you, we don't have a place to put that that material though? No, no. And, and you know, the, again, this is, there's international best practice for this already. Finland have got their deep underground geological facilities. It's just going into operation. There's a system of boreholes, which is, I think would be very suitable for Australia. CSIRO is actually looking into that. Hmm be interested to see what, what comes out of, of that. Um, uh, and then, you know, longer term, we can we can burn this material in in a fast neutron reactor, an advanced reactor. Uh, Professor, I've got a text message on uh, here from Nigel in Charlestown saying, um, can you ask how a nuclear power plant can turn down the production when there's a lot of cheap solar in the middle of the day, which of course is a problem that our coal-fired power stations have faced. Can nuclear power ramp up and ramp down? Yes. So all the, all the modern ones are, are designed to fully load follow. So you can, if you want to do a very fast load follow, 
you can use a turbine bypass so the steam goes instead of to the turbine goes direct to the condenser you can do that um you know france have always had to load follow they've got a lot of nuclear reactors you know 70 percent plus on their system so they always load follow and so it's it's load following is not a new thing for for nuclear i really appreciate your uh, insights and uh, perspective on this today uh, tony owen thank you so much thank you paul I Tony Owen is an honorary associate professor in nuclear physics at the Australian National University.